Welcome back on the AM show. So quite a turbulent year it was, 2022, in terms of recording the depreciation of the Ghana CD. It took off at some point, uh, getting to the tail end of uh, the year, but we looked at inflationary rates, 50.3%, and counting, among others. We're yet to get the figure for December, among others. It was a turbulent economic year. The question is, as we interact with our stakeholders this morning, we'd like to find out what they would like to see in 2023 in terms of the focus, the focus or the focal areas, what they would want government to do in this year. And also in there, I would like my guests at some point to touch on the special prosecutor and what he says about the fight against corruption and how we're going Nowhere, because as my guest this morning for the News Review said, the structures are simply not in place. Well, joining us for now to have this conversation, we have Dr. Joseph Obeng. He is president of the Ghana Union of Traders Association, GUTA, as we call them. And Samson Asaki Awingobit, Executive Secretary, Importers and Exporters Association of Ghana. We also have Professor Lord Mensah, who is a lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School, and Charles Apia Kubi, Executive Secretary, Ashanti Business Owners Association. Uh, for now, I'd like to say a very good morning to Dr. Obeng and Samson Asaki Awingobit. A very good morning to you, gentlemen. I hear all of you yeah. are on. Initially, I heard some of you were not on. A very good morning yeah, to you, gentlemen. Thank you very much, and good morning to your, to you, and good morning to you. Happy New Year to your generous viewers. Great. Yeah, let's let's start you with your uh, your reflections on the year 2022. I'll start with you, Dr. Abeng. Uh, we we saw the industrial action. We saw Kumasi in the Ashanti region. We saw Accra. We saw different dynamics come to play. What, in summary? was 2022 like for you as Guta? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. As we all know, 2022 um, did not help us. It's the year that saw a high rate of inflation, high interest rates, and recorded um, the record mm -hmm. depreciation of the city. Um, these are all the pillars upon which businesses thrive, and that all these pillars were broken. That made business, doing business here very, very difficult. That also saw to the depletion um, of our capitals in the region of about 60%. Okay. And so uh, the year under review had not been um, friendly to businesses. And that's the reason why we also um, uh, push on government to do a little more to save um, the situation by uh, protesting. And um, the latter part saw some gains um, that the city was being um, stabilized, <clears throat> for which we expect that it should be sustained. And so that has been the year in retrospect. And so um, going forward, I think the government main aim now is to industrialize, to ensure self-sufficiency, to stabilize the city and shore up the forest through industrialization. And um, hence the complete reversal of the benchmark um, discount policy as well as shortlisting um, some major uh, commodities that uh, we think that we have comparative advantage to produce here um, by restricting those products from getting the forest um, to, to engage in importation. And so this is the, um, the main goal of government now. What we were seeking that government should have looked um, into the areas that we have the capacity to produce and mm -hmm. itemize those items and give the needed protection and leave um, the majority of the areas that we do not have capacity. Um, if you look 
at our importation, the requirement, uh, the, uh, our import requirement, we can only outsource about 15%, maximum 20% from um, local sources. And that if we should re re uh, remove the benchmark um, policy, it means that um, the majority of products that we procure into this country is going to be um, a very high. That is going to um, um, and not that's not going to help the consuming public. And so uh, this is what we are expecting. And that when government is also going to um, in this direction, we are expecting that it makes funds av available because at the present interest rate of about 40%, it is not conducive for industrialization unless government itself have earmarked some um, funds to um, deliberately help these areas that they seek to support. Um, VAT has also been um, increased. And when you look at the VAT, it's also going to bring some discomfort to businesses. You recall that our um, members in Kumasi embarked on demonstration against the uh, uh, invigilation of uh, the tax officers on the VAT because of simply non-compliance. Because the structure itself is very um, complex and is, it does not ensure compliance. And that we are thinking that um, government should have um, looked into reforming the structure itself so that it will ensure compliance rather than um, increasing um, um, the rate. Mm. And so, um, because we have also, uh, we have said that um, in the market, we have about three systems running concurrently. Those who are charging the standard rate, who now will be paying about 21%, who will be charging about 21%, and then we have those who charge the flat rate of about 4%, and those who do not charge the VAT at all, all operating under the same environment. Right. And so it does not ensure fairness, there's no parity in here, mm. and that we're thinking that these areas will be looked at. What um, is very important for us now, even when government is looking at industrialization and to shore up the forest and also stabilize the, the currency, we are also thinking that government should be able to um, sustain the gains and make sure that the, the city is strengthened. Right. Um, by, by so doing, the government has to look at um, the structural um, problems that we face as a country. And that if you do not look at those structural problems, um, we are not going anywhere. Because um, you, you realize that the demand of the forest far outweighs the supply. Mm. And we have to um, look at where the drain is. Um, we have talked about the fact that there's excessive um, um, repatriation of our limited resources outside because of the foreign dominance of our economy. And that we think that there should be a retention policy. And this retention policy it can only be done by investment laws so that we can at least retain some of this repatriation and then shore up our limited um, um, forest. Okay. Um, yeah, we are also um, saying that um, most of the um, and the foreign, um, the black market, the black market situation in the country has also not helped us and that we think that government efforts should be driven um, regularizing the forest bureau system where um, government or Bank of Ghana will regulate the activities of the uh, forest bureau, streamline it to the purposes for which it was established. Right. And do away with the black market system if we are able to sustain 
um, um, the stability of our currency. Okay. And oh, 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 they, in this case, we are expecting that Bank of Ghana should give the rate um, 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 at which um, these uh, forest bureaus should <sighs> operate. And, and um, the bank rate that the Bank of Ghana uses is the rate that should be communicated to the forest bureaus. As it were now, um, there is a cartel, um, a, a, a cartel in the black market who determines the rate every morning. Because each morning when we go to the market, they will say that the rate has not come. And then when um, it's about 10 o'clock, the, the rate comes. And then uh, it is not the one from the Bank of Ghana. So who determines this rate? So um, in order to make sure that we are able to stabilize the currency, we have to look strictly at the, at the operations of the black market, streamline the activities of the um, uh, forest bureaus, and uh, come under directly um, supervision of the Bank of right. Ghana uh, so that mm. we can... Mm. Point made there, uh, uh, Dr. Bing. Interesting points you've made uh, so far. And since you started off on that trajectory, I would throw it to our other guests as well. But let me start with Professor Lord Mensah. You've heard what uh, Dr. Bing has said. We all want the CD to be stable. But the latest information we're getting, we know that the CD ended 2022 as the second worst or second weakest currency in Africa and the fourth worst globally. And that's according to Bloomberg. We know that for a while it was the worst currency uh, globally. So looking at what data is revealed, uh, it, it suffered, the Ghana CD suffered uh, a loss, year-to-date loss of 38.86% to the US dollar. Then globally, the local currency placed 145th. Sierra Leone, uh, Sierra Leone's Leone uh, came 146th or placed 146th. The Argentinian peso was 147th, and uh, the Sri Lankan rupee was 148th, uh, respectively. That's the order. So it was the fourth worst in the world. You look at the question that uh, Dr. Bing poses about who, who determines the rate of the Ghana CD. And the central bank has clamped down on some Forex Bureau and others. But Others have also spoken about the practicality of it. At some point, you would see the Bank of Ghana rate at eight point something. There was a transaction I, I had to make a few days ago. Uh, at least I'm not a few that was sent to your brother. And the, the bank's rate was very low, seven point something. When in fact, out there, it's far more. So what is your take on this, even as you reflect on on 2022 as a year, Professor Mensa. Yeah, very well. I hope you can hear me. Can I hear can hear me you clear? loud and clear. Fantastic. You know, um, if you, when it comes to exchange rate, um, clearly, I always indicate, I mean, the drivers, and um, I split the drivers to three. Um, the first one is a speculative drive, which normally is detected by the black market. And then also we have the seasonal drive, but then we have the, I mean, the structural drive, which has to do with the structure of our economy, which every now and then um, we tend to have more demand for dollars compared to, you know, um, 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 the supply of the dollar. And so year in, year out, you will see that the dollar keeps on, you know, increasing against the local currency. And every year we seem to penetrate a discrete number, which I've made this point, you know, clear. Um, Getting to the latter part of the year, we saw some stability. And that stability, I will attribute it to, you know, the, 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 the speculative drive that tends to be, you know, toning down. And I, I believe if we should go in the same trajectory. I mean, from this year on, we should be able to, I mean, get to a point where, you know, our, our, our CD will be stable all year through. But I can tell you that with a control of the deviation of the Bank of Ghana's rate to that of the, um, the, the, the black market, um, it is difficult, it will be difficult to control unless the black market does not exist. And I always ask myself, I mean, who are those black market? Can we really integrate them into, you know, the mainstream uh, um, 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 forex, you know, mm -hmm. transactions? Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you that it is going to be difficult. But then we also look at how the black market is created and how monies 
shipped down to the black market. I identified the Bank of Ghana through the banks and then the forest blues as white market. And then we have the black market. If monies are coming from outside or money, monies are, uh, dollars are coming from anywhere, the first spot to find itself is the white market. All the transactions we do through our export, through our international settlement, remittances and all those, comes through the, uh, the, the white market, which Bank of Ghana dominates. But we must ask ourselves the question, how does the dollar get to the black market? Who created that black market? We may have to look at you know, how we can limit the transactions and then possibly reduce the activities of this black market by ensuring that the dollar does not shift to them. Somebody will say if the dollar does not shift to them, uh, there will be scarcity created at that level. If the dollar is not available and Bank of Ghana gives its rate at the white market, obviously whoever is buying, whoever is selling, will stick to the Bank of Ghana's price of the, of the dollar. So for me, we may have to look at how we can block the channels through which you know, um, the dollar shifts to the black market. We should look into the, uh, the regulatory level, look at you know, the bank level, how you know, the dollar gets to the black market. And then also possibly look at the um, dollar activities. Dollar in our environment is not a medium of transaction. It is for, you know, holding it for a purpose of maybe using it for export, sorry, using it for import or transactions that are foreign-based. So if you are doing a local transaction or you are buying it to hold as a store of what? Asset. It shouldn't be given to you. So the purpose and identification of the usage of dollar is very, very important. And then also we should look at the, the, the structure of the economy, which for me, that is not going to be, I mean, the immediate term. We should look at it from, I mean, long-term perspective. Government should be able to align, you know, its fiscal policies with the monetary policy by ensuring that whatever government spends goes into areas that are more sensitive to the economy. Let's take, for instance, food inflation. Food inflation was driving our inflation because man dollars that are required to import them were, were, was getting expensive. So effectively... Now that, you know, fuel prices are coming down at the global market, now that we can see, as a result of that, we can see some stability in the city. Now that we have all these economic, you know, I mean, um, um, advantage, we should ensure that going forward in the year, whatever we are spending goes into agriculture. So, for instance, when you talk about food, what kind of food that we can easily grow in our environment? Within six months, we should have them on our, on, on our, on our market. These are areas I would prefer government channeling what <coughs> our funds do, so that we ensure that even if global price of fuel is going up, we have certain you know I mean levels of inflation that we can control in our environment. Because if you look at last year's inflation, all the uh, uh, disaggregated items were going up, and that is why we were able to hit the fifty, you know, point three. And if I can tell you that if you have your, I mean, fuel price going up, and then you're able to control the local inflation, which is uh, controlling by, food, it, uh, by having more food available, it should be able to, you know, on the average, control inflation in our environment. So for me, I want the government to align whatever readings the size car service brought out from last year, and then see how we can allocate our funds, our expenditure in a direction where it can curb some of this, you know, inflation. Interesting points you've made there. Uh, maybe in just a minute, can you, can you just add your reflections on 2022 so I move to the other guests? Because I gave yeah, you, I threw that question at you, it, it sort of took away from that. Yeah, so you mean 2023 or 2022? 2022. Right, 2022, it was a turbulent year for the country. It was a year that I think most of the things happening in the economy, uh, some of us young ones, we've never experienced them. If you reflect back inflation of about 45% and above, I, will, I, I look back and I saw it somewhere around um, 1992, uh, there about, um, 1990s, and then later part of um, 89. And for inflation to go above all the short term or all the possible interest rate structures, it is an economy that was in, I mean, serious trouble. And um, it's a, it's a year that 
you know, investors lost confidence in the economy. We had to, we had, they had to move their money out. It's a year that, you know, um, even if you have your, 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 your salary, um, what you can purchase has been reduced by almost 50%. Because if you talk about inflation of uh, 50%, that is the implication. So effectively, it, uh, it wasn't a pleasant year at all. And um, businesses were, you know, um, showing signals reflecting what is on the ground. Importers gave up. And if you go to the um, in Tamahabo, they will tell you that importation volumes has reduced completely. And so, I mean, these were all signals that tells you that the economy was, you know, um, in a serious trouble. And I wasn't surprised that we headed to, to the IMF. <coughs> and headed to the IMF with the conditions that came with it by having a debt restructuring, which government couldn't, you know, engage. Then Labour giving give the signals that they will go all up. But going forward, I think we, we put up, you know, some structures. And, I mean, maybe you ask questions on that. So let me leave that one. And right. then um, right. We, we, right. We, 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 when it comes to that, I can speak to it. Let me come to Charles Apiakubi, Executive Secretary, Ashanti Business Owners Association. I had interactions with you last year, and you were a bit distraught about the rise of the dollar against the local currency. I think it got to over 50%. The value eroded about 54% uh, at a point last year. And then we clawed back uh, some of that, closing the year at around 38%, as uh, Bloomberg reports. But for you, what is your succinct, brief reflection on 2022. What did it mean for you, the business community? Um, thank you and good morning to your viewers and Happy New Year. Um, 2022 was a very devastating year for businesses. Uh, we saw a lot of challenges that collapsed a lot of businesses as well. It was a year we saw inflation going as high as 50.30% consumer price index ranging about 144 basis points as of 2022, October. And inflation rate month on month was about 2.7%. Consumer price index on transportation was also high as 154.12%. Policy rate, which is the basis for lending to um, businesses, also went up as 20 we appear to be having a bit of a challenge with the connection to charles apiakubi uh charles i think you're back now please go ahead okay um you are Uh, Charles Apia Kubi is the Executive Secretary of Ashanti Business Owners Association. I guess some calls are interrupting his flow. But you can go ahead now, Charles. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Sorry for that interruption. Uh, we, we saw a policy rate going as high as 27%. Um, producer price inflation rate was about 71.4%. This had some tendencies of collapsing businesses. We saw a lot of capital and coupled with taxations that were also killing businesses. We're looking at government coming with interventions that probably can salvage the business environment, but we could not see that. We were left in limbos and businesses have collapsed. Uh, we are here again 2023, very hopeful probably things will work, but that will mean government re-engaging businesses to understand the plight businesses are going through and in that policies or laws that can probably address us. Over the periods, we have trumpeted that the business community is the engine of growth for this country, an engine that is not lubricated, an engine that is not to be serviced, obviously will break down. When it breaks down, the owner of the car can never use that vehicle again. And that will bring some economic devastating hardship to bearers of those owners of the cars. And that is the situation we have in Ghana, where government policies always have been inward looking without averting to the challenges business are going through. 
We are hoping that 2023, probably, government will avert its mind to the challenges business went through from 2020, during COVID-19, 2021, the post-COVID challenges, and the untold hardship economic challenges brought to businesses, and see how best he can salvage the business community. For 2022, we survived, but it was just by the grace of God. Mm. Thanks for those quick uh, reflections. Uh, I see a message coming through from Yunus Osman, uh, who says, Ghanaians talk too much, no action. You guys should give us a break watching you from Germany. Interesting uh, comments there. But yes, the talk must come in for action uh, to follow. But that brings me to Samson Asaki Awingo bit of the, the Importers and Exporters Association. Do you think we're talking too much and acting too little, even as you reflect quickly on 2022, before we start talking about what your expectations are for 2023? Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me say a very uh, uh, happy new year to my colleagues, especially to Dr. Joseph Faber and my friend in Kumasi and Professor Lord Mercer. Uh, I'm sure 2022 has been a very, one of the difficult years and um, we from the Traders Association has been uh, very vocal on our issues fast forward. Uh, I must say, I don't know whether if the person who uh, texted or tweeted from Germany uh, are saying that we from the business community are talking too much or as a people of Ghana are talking too much or government is talking too much. I, I probably want to believe that he is pushing the, the too much talking to government, which is talking too much rather than taking action. Or I, I, than think, I think you have a point. Needed. I think you have a point there. I, I agree yes. with you. Mm. Yes. So, so it is the government that always comes and promises us. I remember one of the uh, meetings, and Dr. I'm happy that Dr. Ben is here. The finance minister sat before us and told us he's taking Benjamin values 30% uh, from us. And he was going to an ad hoc committee from government side and our side, that's the business community side. And he was going to find a mitigating factor for us. Since that March or that April meeting that we that, that announcement was made, till date, 2023, January 2nd, we have not had any meeting anywhere in the finance ministries to discuss whether the committee was formed. Who were those committees? What was discussed? Because we were told that they were going to do this in step by step three segments, but nothing. So you see the government that will come, and then of course when Kumasi and Aguta also strike down their, their demonstration, they sat down uh, uh, in our market. Then you have a deputy minister who came on air, and I'm sure he was even on your air, PM Express or one of the pl your platform, and said, oh, Dr. Ben has stopped them from their back because they have agreed nicely that the government was going to give us a flat rate at the port. And so what they did, it is not good for, uh, they have not shown any good faith. Just talk, lose talk and go away without nobody calling him to order. So as he said about the, the flat rate, the whole Ghana was happening, oh, but government is giving more flat rate at the port. As to now, as we speak, there's nothing happening. So you see, you have a government that will come into this system, very, with a very nice package, tell the whole Ghana that, look, we are going to move you from taxation to production. And as we speak, we, we will be business friendly. And I can tell you, Kumasi, and I'm happy the executive secretary from traders in Kumasi is here. And I'm happy that Dr. Ben is here. Dr. Ben led a delegation to the president. And the president sat in front of him and told him, oh, my finance minister is outside New York. He's coming over the weekend. I will have engaged him with, I will engage with him. And then there will be something positive coming. Little do we know that they retired from that engagement to three days retreat. The president came back and said, oh, even if you look at our taxation, Ghana is the lowest so far as West Africa is concerned. And that we should be expecting more uh, taxes to be rolled by the GRA. Then we're, we're skeptical. We're watching whether, uh, but it's not at the rate of 19.1. Because if you had 12.5 VAT, 1.2.5 debt fund, 2.5 health insurance, then 1% special levy, it's amount of total VAT was amount around to over 90 point something. The claim that business community were to claim was only the 12.5 input tax. There's a difference, there's a cost element. So 
businesses were struggling and I said that the rate that you move, where you move, everybody, many, many of the business people from the ordinary 3% flat rate without even discussing with us. Because when they were, they were going to build the 3% flat rate, they had engagement with Guta. But this one, when they were taking it away, there was no any consultation. They moved everyone to 90.2. Then they asked GRM staff to go all over the country. That hesitated or that brought the shutdown of Asanto region, then the shutdown in Kumasi. We met the president, the, promise, the president gave a promises. In 2023 budget that was presented somewhere in November, we did not see anything. We rather saw additional increase. So I want to ask whether if Guta, led by Dr. Joseph Abe, went to Flash Star House and a Jubilee House and told the president, right, we want you to increase more of the tax, or they went there to tell him that, look, the tax component is killing, and everybody was struggling. And I believe in my mind that that was exactly what Dr. Ben said. He told them that the VAT was killing. In fact, and they were saying that they should bring people back, shouldn't be compulsory. But what do we see? Government say, oh, we hear something good. Then we wake up in the morning. Then in the afternoon, the government is doing different things. Increasing another VAT, 2.5, making it 15%. Then that is going to be a huge cost on us. You ask yourself, is it going to be input 20%, 20%, so that government will get the difference 2.5 as government revenue? So that if it's 20% at the port, then I'm going to sell at 20%, then I'll take my 20% input tax from the port. Then the difference with the 2.5 will be government revenue, then we will not have any problem. But I'm not quite sure. I am not quite sure whether government will want us to have input 20%, output 20%, so that government will get the difference that he's bringing the 2.5. And that would be revenue for government, only two point five. So that I mean, I claim I think ten percent that I'm paid at the point. That is not what government is pushing. So you can imagine that we have a government that will tell you A in the morning and then B in the evening, and nobody can hold them together. You go on strike. You go to the president himself. He will sit and he look at your face and ask you your your demonstration that you did, your closest of shops. What have you? What have you gained when other those who are making the money? All open. You can imagine. So you can you can see that clearly there's no there's a lack of leadership at, at, at the top there. Because Th this this assertion you make, this this assertion you make about you go and meet the president and he looks you in the face and says, So the strike you you embarked on, what did you gain from it? And others are open and they're making money. Is this a meeting you were in personally, or are you just re-echoing what someone told you? I am re echoing, you know, I'm in mean, business circle, so whatever goes and comes, I get the information. I, I just, I just want a clarity on that, that you, you were not at a meeting when this happened. I wasn't, Some, someone told absolutely. you this. Absolutely. I was All right, so this meeting, is conjecture. Even, even, exactly, even if I was not at the meeting, the reason that took us to the, to, to, to the Jubilee House, the reason that the president called them in the night, he made out to get, within one hour space, that I want to see people. When they went, the promise that the president gave, that is not what is reflecting in the 2023 budget. The budget is completely, did not have any regard to the submission that was made by Traders Union to the president. Mm. And I'm, I'm happy that the commerce man is there, Dr. Yosef Obe, my senior comrade, is there. If any of the pleas that was sent to the president, if it was actually captured, they will say, my All friend right. from Kumasi wasn't there. Mm. But I know Dr. led the team to the place. Right. And that was what, that was the exact words by His Excellency the President. So I can tell you, 2022 was one of the challenging years. I remember somewhere 20, 22nd, thereabout, I went to Fishing Harbor. You could see clearly that the Fishing Harbor was like a ghost, like a cemetery. Total silence. So I asked, what is the problem? The problem was Pegasus power. So, so if anybody suffered in 2022 review, I will tell you it's the business community. You remember somewhere March 20, 20, 21st March 2022, the, the governor, the governor of Bank of Ghana, had a meeting and called you the media and asked the commercial banks that our prime rate was 14.5, we up it to 17 percent prime rate. Uh, prime rate. Banks increase your interest rate. And I said, look, when the prime rate was at 14.5, we from business sector community was calling that Bank of Ghana, please then talk to commercial banks to, to also 
reduce their interest rate to be in consonance with what your prime rate are. Bank of Ghana or the, the, governor, the governor of Ghana was the governor of Bank of Ghana was silent. He never made any statement at the time we were calling that if prime rate is low, interest rate should not be at where it is. Never it moved to 17, he said the suit. So we asked ourselves, was it benefiting the struggle of business community or what? Then right. from there, you move right. it again from 17 to 22, then from 22 to 27 plus. That's where if a prime rate went last year. Then interest rate, of course. Then you should be talking about borrowing between 30%, 40%. What can you do with it? How will you be able to pay? Mm. You also had a punch. Africos is just close to us. Africos has also, when MPS came in 2018, or 20, yeah, 2018, there about 20, 2019, there about in operations. We thought, oh, we are the biggest port so far as West Africa is concerned. We can receive the biggest vessels. However, our counterpart in Africos had moved to put up the same bigger uh, terminal or port that can also receive the biggest vessel. And the cost of doing business in Africos is far, far lower, making us losing majority of our transit cargo to Africos and Kilome. Coupled with our taxes in our port, the financial service levy, and the community levy, and other levies, had made our port very expensive, saying that even the Ghanaian imports had dropped. That is why during December, we were not seeing traffic on the Tama motorway, nor the Nungwa Tama Beach Road. And it was quite clear that no, not that people cannot import, the cost of doing business. Then remember our 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 uh, what rate? What the customs are using for the dollar indexing? Custom move. We we, we, guess, we, we sleep. We wake up in the morning. The custom move from seven seven point two to nine point five. The difference was about one city twenty percent or so. Then we ask ourselves: My so many years of advocacy at the port, I have never seen the indexing of custom. Move beyond 50 pesos. If it will be increased 10 pesos. Remember, so from 9.5, then they move to 9.6. Then the following week, they move it to 10.5. Right. Then to 10. Right. So this also increased our, our taxes. So it is clear, so it is clear, Samson, that 2022 was not a good year uh, for you, especially as importers and exporters. And later on, I'll be coming to you in terms of import substitution and what we can uh, look at in that respect. But let me bring in Dr. Joseph Obain. I, I want you to look at a, a few things. Maybe you can premise what you're going to say with whether you corroborate what uh, 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 Samson had been saying about meetings with the president and all of that. You were in some of those meetings. But let me find out from you. We're, we're approaching an IMF deal. We're hoping that we get the deal. Some economists have said, uh, if we don't get the deal, it could spell doom for us, economic doom. And the finance minister has basically said, uh, you know, it, it would do same. There's the debt exchange program, which some have said still has a lot of work to be done uh, on. Uh, you consider the fact, for example, that initially individual bondholders were not to be involved, but pensions were going to be affected over 2 billion Ghana cities. Now, on the back of the TUC's uh, threat of an industrial action, the pensions have been taken off and individual bondholders have been brought on board. Then again, we can talk about import substitution. And I'm throwing these questions out to that, gentlemen, all of us can reflect on them. Tomatoes, for example. In 2020-2021, we got some seedlings uh, from Burkina Faso so we could, because their variety is more juicy and all of that, uh, we got them into the country. What has become of that? When you look at the numbers, it appears we've not made any gains, in fact, from those. You can talk about the one district, one factory. I always say three things. How many jobs have been created? How much of our imports have been cut down on the back of those factories? And... How much are we saving as a country? These are questions I'd like us to reflect on. What would you like to see in these areas in 2023? Dr. Obey. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, IMF will come. They will make some injections into the economy. But if we do not look at the structural problems, 
that is militating against the economy, then it will come and we, do, we will not have any effect. The same thing will replay that the sharks, the hawks, and the pythons in the economy will swallow whatever injection that the government will do. That's why we, we have always been saying that we have to revisit our investment laws uh, to make sure that um, um, the repatriations that some of these multinationals do, that um, the areas that we have capital price, the cross-border trading at a mon a trade of money, and all, all these things should be looked at. How we'll be able to retain some of the uh, forests that we have for ourselves as a country? What laws are we making that um, a, a foreign country, a, a, a foreign um, um, direct investment that have been successful here do not take all the gains, but make sure that at least 30% is retained for redevelopment of the country. If we, we do not do this, then um, uh, uh, we are going to have a perennial problem that will not help. So our problem is very structural. And even before we assess um, the loans from um, IMF, we should be able to address um, these problems first. If you do not do that, then we are not serious at the way to go. And so that is very important. Um, when it comes to the local enhancement of local productivity, um, you see, the pain has been capital um, acquisition. And now we are saying that we should go into um, rice uh, uh, production and that we should grow this rice locally. And who can go and uh, source a capital for 40%, a lending rate of over 40%, and use it to go and grow rice and compete um, uh, with the rest of the world? It's never uh, practicable. So that's how governments will come in and fund a deliberate um, effort to inject some funds and to subsidize um, these areas. If that is done, I believe. And then we have to also evaluate and see where we have the comparative advantage, where we have the resources uh, to do. Sometimes we do not even have to think about the uh, bigger uh, manufacturing entities who, do, who may not have the competitive edge or globally. But we have to look at our industrial base. When we used to have the coconut oil, the granite oil, um, the garis, and all that, how we get simple tools um, to enhance on their productivity, to um, add value, and also pack it well. Right. That's how the bigger economies like China and all that, they did not start it very big. Those, the little ones that we ignore, are the basis. That, uh, those are the, our industrial base. And those are the areas that we even do not recognize that they are part or integral part of um, um, our industries. And so if you have to uh, redesign our industrialization policy to adopt all this, you, you recognize that um, the, the, uh, um, the made in Kumasi, um, Sanders, and all that. It is done, it's dying gradually because it is not being captured, captured as a, um, 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 a, a, a mainstream um, manufacturing entity. And they are being made to pay high rates for a leather that they import. So, but if it had been a bigger um, a, a factory um, or manufacturing entity, then they will lobby government and they, they'll give them um, the subsidies to do that. The textile industry, our uh, dressmakers and all that, they also need that um, textiles uh, be looked at and okay. that they can also source these um, 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 products at cheaper price so that they can sell their output at a competitive price. Right. But we are the bigger picture and that's where we are failing. Now let me come to um, what uh, Mr. Asaki was talking
talking about. Okay, so so um, because of uh, what the time we have left, briefly on that, so I can move on uh, to the others yeah, as well. But it may not be fair if we do not clear some of these things because the president this, um, uh, did respect our meeting um, with him, and then he agreed on us on several um, points that we have made. At, um, we we submitted uh, fifteen point um, solutions. And it, out of the 15, the only uh, friends, um, only one, and that the president himself said that we are, are agree with all of this and that we are going to submit to um, um, EMT, Economic Management Team, um, 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 to factor into our policy. And then the except one that uh, um, the president referenced it and said that the, he cannot agree with this. Um, with the, um, uh, he's saying that the uh, president said that uh, why do we uh, why do we uh, close? He did not say that. We have argued that um, the they said that we do excessive importation, and we are saying that the government can use investment laws um, to contain some of this excessive importation because the local share of this importation is only about uh, uh, less than twenty percent. And that the China malls and all that should not dump the goose here. And so we were telling the government to use investment laws to contain this uh, excess um, um, influx of goods um, which is being dumped into the economy. And then the government, the president sympathized with this and said that much as you are at the receiving end, you are also, um, again, closing your shop to also aggravate your plight. And that's what the president said, and he did not say anything okay. negative. Right. So th I, I beg him, because let me tell you, after our meeting with the president, then the president followed it out, uh, up, and then met with about uh, five other uh, stakeholder groupings. And that's where, after they have um, um, solicited our views and our solutions and all that, the president came uh, to address the nation and um, articulated his policy direction. Bank of Ghana also started plumbing on the. Um, so so uh, I think, I think, Doctor Bing, the point the point is made, which is why I also probed further with Samson Asaki Awingobe because some of these claims, when they are made, that's why I pinned him on whether he had been at this meeting and he admitted he had not. So thanks for that clarity. You were there. Let me come to Professor Mensa on on this beat. Uh, so same set of questions, but I. Interesting uh, that Dr. Obeng talks about the co uh, competitive advantage that we are not taking you know, advantage of, uh, so to speak. What, what are our niche areas as a country and how can we better them in 2023? And importantly, I recall 2021 to 2022, a lot of people tend to forget. I shared it in my blunt thoughts. Ghana was the biggest exporter of yam. And I'm asking myself, I pose those questions. I'm sure everybody has forgotten. The Agric Ministry, for example, if we're exporting so much yam, are we looking at better varieties of yam? Are we looking at varieties that can yield more in terms of the different things it can be used for, in terms of the output? What are we doing to maintain our position, for example? These are things you don't see any reflections on. Do we even have policy on this? Professor Mensah. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, when it talks about um, variety, I may not be able to I mean, discuss so much into it, but um, I'm not a great expert to talk about uh, variety. No, no, these were just my thoughts I, I was putting out there in terms of uh, what, what probably we could be doing. Hello, Prof. Let's see whether we can get uh, Professor Lord Mensah to uh, uh, work out that connection. Uh, on a day like this, well, a lot of people holidaying, so sometimes there, there are connectivity issues. Uh, Professor Lord Mensah, of course, is with the University of Ghana Business School. Prof, can you hear me now? It appears he still can't. I'll get back to Prof on that question when he's uh, ready. Charles, uh, back to you. So. Debt exchange, IMF, import substitution, comparative advantage. W what do you think of this? How can we... Okay, so Charles, just hold for me. I'm told Prof is in. Let me just do this. Prof, back to you. 
Yes. So, uh, like I was saying, it could be that for that particular year, we had very good favorable, you know, weather condition for yam growth. And that is why possibly we recorded, you know, um, that kind of, you know, um, massive you know, yam growth. It may not be as a result of any policy that we place in place. If it's policy, then consistently we should see an increase, I mean, as a result of what the policy is doing. But, but, but quick one, quick, quick intervention, even if it's not policy, and you benefit from what, some bounty harvest and all of that, shouldn't it become policy so that you retain your position, so that you can maintain that, you know, that the status quo? That, that is why I mentioned that maybe it's nature that is detecting that. You, you, you can use nature for a policy. Nature can change the, its course at any point in time. So if nature favors you to have more plantain on the market as a result of the heavy rains that we witnessed this year, if nature favors you to have more yam on the market, it does not necessarily mean that your policy is yielding. And that is why I'm saying that it could be as a result of, you know, the weather conditions or the, 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 the whatever weather it is supporting, you know, yam growth during that particular year. But then also, let me tell you one thing. You see, this particular year, we're looking at, you know, the impact of policies on our economy. And the impact of on our economy to ensure that we break down inflation, to ensure that we control exchange rates, and to ensure that at least there is more, you know, export and possibly we minimize import to um, some goods that or some product that we can go in our environment. How do we do this? I can tell you that the same management structure that we had, that sent inflation to skyrocketed values like 50.3%, and then also exchange rate to about 15 and all those, causing more speculations and the trust that we've, we've, we've lost in the system, the same management cannot bring us out. I believe that one, in as much as we are looking for an IMF program to come and help us shaping the economy, IMF program may not necessarily be just the capital injection alone. They come in and there are some soft benefit, which has to do with the restrictions on government. You know, even though I've had my problems with some of these restrictions, um, that could be, I see it to be too much open. I'll come to the details of that. But I'm telling you that, you know, the same structures we had that sent us to that kind of economic quagmire in uh, 2022, we cannot maintain the same management structures. We need to revisit the table and see who is not performing. We cannot have, have an agreed minister for two terms for which, you know, um, um, food inflation has been leading all the inflation disaggregation over the, over the I mean, few uh, uh, months that we had this inflation skyrocketing. Because we had uh, planting for food and jobs. You know, we, ha we had budget allocated for it. And consistently, if you do the text mining exercise of our budget, uh, budget policies over the past, you know, six years, you realize that planting for food, food and jobs keeps on, you know, I mean, I mean, repeating itself every now and then. That shows that it's a policy that the country had interest in. But is this policy making an impact? We're not seeing that. Let me also look at this. We're going to IMF. IMF may come in with restrictions. Don't spend, in sorry, cut down your budget you know, deficit to about 5%. Cutting down budget deficit means that you are going to reduce your expenditure. Possibly find a way to increase your revenue. If you are not able to increase your revenue, we should be able to look at how we can cut down expenditure. Cut down expenditure and then spend in areas that can have direct impact on the economy. That is why I'm saying that... <clears throat> we seem to have lost uh, Prof one more time. We'll bring him in. Charles Apiakubi is Executive Secretary of Ashanti Business Owners Association. What is your take on all this? Well... Um, anything about national development has got to do with a conscious decision of government and decoupled with partisan politics and ensuring that what must be done to help Ghana become the beacon of hope in Africa is done to the best of the country and that of businesses. The relation between government and business are inextricably linked. So it's always important government engage businesses with policies that obviously have tendencies of affecting the business environment. 
But over the period, you find out that there's this knee-jerk reaction policies that do not sync with the dynamics within the business environment. So government policies have always been like um, counterproductive to the kind of businesses we run in this country. One of them that we have obviously been talking about is the VAT. VAT, we have told government on different platforms that this is a killer to businesses. It's, it's devastating you, a lot of businesses. So can we look at Hello? the administration? Uh, Prof, we can, we can hear you. Just hold. Uh, just hold. I'll come back to you uh, shortly. Charles Apia is making a point. Go ahead, Charles. Yes. We have told government, can we look at the administration of this VAT? Can we look at the structure of this VAT? So probably it can sync with the dynamics within the business environment that there will be self-compliance. And over the period that I have been part of this kind of engagement, over four years now, that has never been done. But year on year, we see government increasing the same thing that we said it is devastating businesses. We told them, especially within the FMCG space, because of the kind of distribution channel that we run, VAT has a cascading effect, therefore making cost of items much more expensive. And two, because the market is not so much structured, there are a lot of people who have not been registered as VAT agents. So they are advantaged, and those who have been registered are disadvantaged. For a period, those who have been registered are not also charging the VAT. And we are using our working capital to pay for VAT. This is wrong. It is depleting our working capital. Government who have been shortened in the market. Can we sit down so that you appreciate what happens within uh, the FMC sector so we can introduce much more resilient, much more um, supporting policies that will make us feel comfortable in complying so that you can also rake in the kind of revenue you're looking for. Government has not done that. We have seen an increase in, in, in VAT standard rate again. So what happens is government will increase taxes, you will not get the taxes, who will collapse businesses, and this country is dipping down and down and down. In other but words, in other words, that. government's policy direction is simply not working. It's not working. Mm. It's not working. It's not that's where we are where we are now. You remember BOG came up with policy rates to arrest inflation. And I asked myself, have those policy rates able to arrest inflation? The answer is no. Then that means that there's a problem in the way we evaluate situations and assess policies and see how best we can support the business community. If you mm. decide to increase policy rate to make borrowing expensive and you cut out the businessman from the business, how do you get your revenue? Right, right. You're not making the right investment in sectors that will support this economy. When business are well taken care of, this, this economy will be well off. We will might not need to go to IMF. And, and speaking I of mm. investing benchmark values and people are calling that is also wrong. At this time, business have been devastated with all these economic challenges. The little that we have, we are also increasing a uh, cost of climbing goods at the ports. That is wrong. Okay. When 2017, His Excellency ba Baumia, the vice president, made that brilliant assessment that we need to have a benchmark value so that we can increase traffic at the port. So we can get the trade facilitations, so that we can get revenue. What has happened? Good question. They, 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 what, what has happened what? since then? So interesting perspectives that you share. Uh, we're pressed for time. Let me just do this. Bring Prof back briefly to share his thoughts. And then I'll give a final uh, slot to each one of you with uh, just a, a brief thought on corruption. And then we can take it from there. Prof, just round up for us on, on the thoughts that you were sharing. Very briefly, sir. Professor Mensa? Uh, okay, so let's, let's do this. The very final bit I wanted us to look at, gentlemen, has to do with corruption. We're told that we bleed over $4 billion every year. I'm wondering whether we would have ended up at the doorstep of the IMF, you know, uh, if we had been able to stem the tide of corruption. Maybe not, you, you can't get rid of it completely, but if we had been able to put in place systems to deal with this uh, menace. Uh, on the back of that, we also have heard from the special prosecutor who says he doesn't know whether we are actually as serious as we ought to be about fighting corruption. 
And I found that very telling for someone like that to make this point. What would be your concluding remarks on this very issue? I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Bing. Unless we have Prof back. Is, is Prof Zamenta back? Hello, Prof. Can you hear me? Yes, I am. I am. I'm back. Yes. So what I was saying is that we should change the structures. We should change the structures of our management. And right. if we change the structures, it should be able to help us. Because otherwise, the benefit that we're supposed to reap from this debt exchange exercise, we may not reap that benefit. Because mm. once we create that fiscal space, and government is spending, and government is spending in, into areas that are not effective or that are not making impact on the economy, we may not realize the benefit of that fiscal exercise. That, so I'm saying that we are calling for debt restructuring, all right, which it's part of the IMF conditionalities. But if we don't take care and we maintain the same management structures, we may not get the benefit of the IMF. We may not realize the benefit of this debt restructuring as, I mean, we, we, we're going on. Because okay. it's a sacrifice Ghanaians are going to do. We are going to defer our investment returns. We seem to have lost uh, Prof one more time. Dr. Obain, you heard my question about uh, corruption. That's what I, I'd like us to end on. 30 seconds each. Uh, just briefly, hit the nail on the head. Dr. Obain. Yeah, uh, corruption has been the pain. It's a monster to our economy, and we need to check it. Um, we overspent our limited revenue that we get. When revenue has been squeezed out, um, from the business community and the generality of Ghanaian taxpayer, we overspend it because we do not ensure value for money. Expenditure. We overprice our expenditure through corruption. And that look have to be looked at. If we're able to prone down on corruption, prone down on expenditure, then of course our limited resources can cater, care, uh, can cater for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abeng, for those uh, concluding comments. Let me also take those from uh, Charles. Uh, Charles, what would be your concluding comments in line with uh, corruption and anything else you have to share? Very well. Thank you once again. Of course, um, policies itself introduces corruption within the system. When you have only in increased VAT, to that, obviously, you give the room for the businessman to re-engage and disperse for a discount from a policy implementer. Go, go when, ahead, go when, ahead, Charles. Ch Charles, if you can hear me, go ahead. Oh, it appears the connections, uh, right when the crucial points are being made, uh, it just... But, but that is also testament to the sort of internet connectivity we have in this country. I think it's a conversation we should have, the quality of internet connectivity, if not calls interrupting. But Charles, go ahead. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Go ahead. Very well. So, so policies obviously also have bearings on the kind of corruption we, we find ourselves in this country. So we want government to re-engage the business community in introducing policies. You see, when policies emanate from the people, compliance are so much high that it becomes difficult for anyone to breach the policies or the conditions around those policies. Let, 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 me, let, let, me, let me just do this. You, you speak about government reaching out to people like you, your groupings, to bring out policies and that the buy-in would be great. If you could, if you had a way and if government would adopt one policy from you, what policy would that be? Give us one. It would be the VAT. Okay. The value-added policy. You see, we have talked about the, how it's wrecking down a lot of businesses and how government is even being short-chained within the market. You see, the point is, if I am not charging is a consumption tax, if I am not passing on to the consumer, it also means I have to use my working capital to pay for it. How long can I sustain doing this? 
Mm. I will be tempted to renegotiate with someone to pay less. And the majority of said revenue goes personal pocket than getting to the, the government kitty. Okay. Okay. Two, because I, I am not paying the right VAT, my books are also not right. So corporate income tax that government is supposed to realize for me, government will not receive it. When it comes to assessing the business performance, because I have not kept proper records of my business transactions, it becomes difficult for the bank to assess whether my business is doing well or not, and to describe what kind of capital inve investment they have to place in my business. So most of the time, you see banks giving loans to businesses, and the businesses are collapsing because of some of these negating effects coming from a policy called VAT. Right. Right. So and so if you had your way, pay, that's one thing you would tackle. Mm. Exactly. Business want to pay taxes, but we want to pay taxes that are right, that resonate with the dynamics and the challenges within our market. And okay. that we are ready to support government to grow this country, to achieve its economic development goals. All right. Uh, Charles, thank you so much uh, for sharing your thoughts with us. Let's wrap with uh, Professor Menta, who is back. Prof, you have just about a minute to share uh, your final thoughts with us. The connection has not been uh, fair to us today. Sure, 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 sure. I, I hope you can hear me. I can. Go ahead. Yes, on corruption. You see, we, we live in a country where we have segregated corruption. But corruption is more or less like a suicide, you know, I mean, bomber. Somebody who is corrupt is more or less like a suicide bomber. You see, you can be corrupt in your own, you know, workplace. But then the impact that you are making with your corruption, the negative impact, is so huge that it's affecting the masses. If you were to carry bomb to go and kill them, you would have been better. It's as a result of corruption that we can see our economic situation in that way that we find ourselves in. And it's affecting all of us to the extent that the economy has got into our doorstep. For me, where I sit, for us to you know, solve the problem, mm -hmm. we shouldn't disaggregate corruption. To get to know corruption at the executive level, corruption at the ordinary level, and corruption even in our homes. Well, let's treat corruption as corruption. Whoever is corrupt is corrupt. Once we get you, we must punish you. Those countries that are doing what they have control over corruption, to a some point, if you get corrupt, they slaughter you. So for me, I think uh, we may, we may have to represent leave it for our judges and a lot of interpretations, and we speak around English around it. Trust me, we may not get a solution. I believe corruption is corruption. Let's not segregate it. A sin is a sin. There's no bigger sin. There's no smaller sin. Interesting comments, uh, Professor Lord Mensa, uh, to wrap this conversation. We're grateful to all of those who joined Dr. Joseph Obeng. Uh, he is Guta President, Samson Asaki Awingobed. He is President, uh, Executive Secretary of the Importers and Exporters Association of Ghana. You just heard Professor Lord Mensa, lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School. We also had Charles Apiakubi, Executive Secretary, Ashanti Business Owners Association. Well, still.